tell you, I must have wore you people out on the Holy Ghost this morning. So quiet and reserved, which is all right, you know. It's good to be in church and enjoy just being here. Every service is not the same. And I thank the Lord for all that. I thank the Lord for what he did this morning and how he touched people around the altars. And, and what a powerful, powerful service we had. The Holy Spirit uh, is available to us in the church today. And we thank the Lord we have that opportunity to be able to avail ourselves, if you will, to the Holy Spirit. We bring him with us, and there's a lot of uh, terminologies we have in the church today, and I thought it quite interesting. I was looking, uh, along with someone else, at the book that Sister Barb's going to be teaching on the 31st. That's one of the best teaching sessions, I believe, the Assemblies of God have ever put out. Is the one coming up this 31st of March, this day-long seminar. It dealt with terminologies that we use in the church and how that lots of people don't understand them. And you know, folks, we've often talked about bringing the Holy Spirit with us. And that is true. You know, I have preached and preached to you, and I don't know, uh, I don't want any gratitude from you in any way, shape, or form. But I hope these messages on the baptism of the Holy Spirit have, have taught our church in a new, fresh way. Uh, what our distinctive is and what makes our church a spiritual church, a Pentecostal church. Not because of the word 50 or not because of uh, in relation to the sacrifices that were done in the Old Testament, which can be referred to, but because on the day of Pentecost, God poured out his Holy Spirit. And it's for the church and it's for everybody. And I thank the Lord for that. I, I can remember back in the in the uh, old days of church and uh, I'm going to turn my mic on here if I can see my brother. There we go. Uh, I can remember in the, in the days of the church, in the early days of the church, at least when I was a boy, uh, that that people would come into church and and there would just be no question. Whatever happened in the church, if people started seeking for the baptism, they sought for it for him too. And uh, uh, people got saved and, and the Holy Spirit moved through the church. But you know, folks, uh, things have changed. And we're in a different situation where people are coming from all walks of life that have to be persuaded When they come into church, they're not going to take your word for it. They want it to be proved to them. Now, maybe that's good. Maybe it's not. But at any rate, that's why we're teaching on the baptism. is because these new people need to understand and need to know how to seek God and what to seek for and why we ought to seek God. And as we do that, we're going to see people, and you'd be surprised, folks, my office, my counseling sessions are filled every week. You'd be surprised how many families in our church right now do not understand even what the term Holy Spirit means. They don't even know what that term means, coming to this church right now. So it is very important that we dwell on this, that we teach our people. And that we prepare them to step out by faith and receive what God is wanting to give to them. It's good to have you with us tonight. Thank the Lord for all, all of you and for your faithfulness to the house of God. If you have your Bibles tonight, I want you to turn with me, first of all, to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 12. I want to begin reading with verse 42, and then we're going to go to chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians. 
And there we are going to uh, use a portion of that chapter as the body of our message tonight. If I was to use a theme, I'd like to use these words. Living in the light of the second coming. Or living in the light of eternity. We, we have sort of wore out the statement, if you will. You can't wear it out, but sometimes people think you do. About Jesus coming back, the second coming of Christ. And uh, oftentimes I've heard it asked me most recently, Pastor, why are we saying so much? We already know. We know he's coming back. Well, the Bible instructs us to not ever quit preaching it. And to telling all of us and reminding us that Jesus may come at any moment. And every moment we live for the Lord, ladies and gentlemen, we're living under the light of that second coming. We're living under the light of eternity. And that is a very, very serious place for us to live. Follow me, if you will. A very choice portion of scripture. Luke chapter 12, verse 42. We're going to read through 48. And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Now I want you to remember verse 42. Who is that faithful and wise steward? The word steward means keeper. Those who keep things, look after things. Whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Please mark that if you mark your Bible. I am a firm believer it isn't what we talk. It's how we live. Anybody, my mom used to say when I tried to give her a long story about why I did something wrong. And she had the razor strap. How many's ever seen a razor strap? How many's ever had it on you? No wonder. Now I know what's wrong. No, I'm just kidding. I'll tell you, I've had her many times. And I'm not saying that's the best route. But I'll tell you, folks, uh, when I see the stuff happening around our country and in our world today, I think we need to get it back out. Amen. There needs to be more instruction, manual instruction, in the home. I call it manual instruction. Before we know it, we can, we can be at a point to where we don't know. And that doesn't matter how well we train our kids. But uh, what a permissive age we live in when there are absolutely no absolutes at all. And uh, we wonder where we do stand. Listen to it. Of a truth, verse 44. I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and the maidens, and to eat and drink and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware. And will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will. I want you to notice that and mark it if you mark your Bible. And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will or God's will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not, let's just get a little clearer there. I had the question asked me just a week or two ago. Pastor, what's going to happen to the people that never heard the name of Jesus? What is going to happen to them? Where are they going to go? They're going to go to hell. Sorry, I've got to say that. They're going to be lost without God. 
But he that knew not, verse 48, that never had the privilege of hearing about Jesus. And did commit things worthy of stripes, in other words, sin, and lived in sin, shall be beaten with what? Few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. You know, folks, just before I pray, it is a very serious thing to make a promise to God and not keep it. How many understand that? It is a very serious thing. And the thing is, we're, we're between a rock and a hard place in this. Because it's a serious thing to make a promise to God about your life and how you'll live it. But it's yet even a more serious thing with God if you fail to make a commitment. Because you're out automatically lost. You're automatically lost without God. Where once we make a commitment to God and we promise God we're going to live for Him and we're going to do what He's asked us to do, then there is a big responsibility and we're going to be judged for what we know. But thank God we'll have redemption if we stay within the confines of the blood of Christ. And that's one of the statements that is being used in Barb's study is what do people mean? I'm going to take away from the smoke, Barb. So I just want to say this. I'm not going to go try to deal with it. But one of the comments we make is uh, about pleading the blood of Jesus and, and stuff like that. And what does it mean? Well, uh, many of us in the church knows what it means. Others may not. Come to the study on the 31st. Sign up and get a book. And, uh, and not only the teachers and the workers who are expected to be here, but those who would like to just hear the ministry. It will be a great blessing to you. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless your word and make it real to us. Tonight, Lord, we, we, have, we just have been so thankful for how you have worked in the lives of people. And Lord, the Holy Spirit was poured out this morning in individuals. And not only were some uh, filled or refilled, but Lord, there was healings in physical bodies. And uh, Lord, sometimes we have to just make that step and we have to come forward before that can come to pass. I pray, Jesus, you'll continue to pour out your spirit in this church on families that have never been introduced to, it, to him before, that have never known about this experience. May the Holy Spirit be poured out upon them. Lord, fill our church with the Holy Ghost. Lord Jesus, from one end of this church to the other, from one end of families to the other, I pray that whole families will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. But more than that, Jesus, after we receive that born-again experience, baptism of the Holy Spirit, baptized in water, then comes the full commitment of saying, Lord, what we've said we're going to do for you, we're going to do. We're going to make it. We're going to be faithful. Let me, Lord, give this word as you have shared it to my heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, I think one of the problems today, not only in society in general, but in the society of the church, is that we are not living like Jesus is ever coming back. This makes it more and more difficult for God to do what he wants to do in our lives. We've let down, am I free to say this? I'm going to say it anyway. In general, church people have let down their standards. Standards of holiness are not what they used to be. Am I too harsh? They're not what they used to be. It doesn't bother us to go out and do things in the world that the church used to not only frown on, but people used to literally be convicted about. And today, we do them without uh, so much as a hesitation. Then we say, oh God, why don't you pour out your spirit? Folks, it all comes back to living under the light of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And Peter talked about this same thing in one of his books in the New Testament. 
He says, they, they say, why do you keep saying and looking for his coming? He hasn't come yet. He, he's not going to come. Peter warned us about that. And here in the book of Luke, we are warned about it again by Jesus himself. Let me tell you something. We will be responsible for the knowledge we have gained. Let me go down the line for you. You talk about punishment in hell. Hell's punishment will be hot. If we would sit in a church under the ministry of God's word and be offered in every service the opportunity to be born again. To accept Christ as our personal Savior. And we would refuse to do that and walk out of the church. Let me tell you folks, after hearing the gospel presented and actually feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit and walking out and refusing God, we would receive many stripes. What about... We just got through with water baptism, so probably this is not a good example. What about water baptism? Sitting under the word, hearing the importance of being baptized in water, and then refusing it or feeling like it's not important. I believe we'll answer to God for those things. Amen. Why, Pastor? Because you say it? No, because Jesus commanded it. Amen. And he told us to do it. And if we refuse to do it, we will answer before God for rebelling against His direct commands. How many believes that? So if we fail to make it, what I'm talking about tonight is failing to make it in the rapture. Well, God's a gracious God. There's another phrase that's used loosely. God's a gracious God. He sure is. But let me tell you something, folks. There, God has limits too. And He will only let us go so far and rebel against moving in advance toward God's best. And if we refuse to do that, somewhere along the line we're going to pay. We're going to pay. I see it happen all the time. Talk to parents just today. And I, I know my heart is heavy. And I'll tell you something, folks, I have prayed, whether it be for my youngest son, and I'm going to be candid with you tonight, because I stand here as a pastor, and I am frustrated, and I feel like I've been a poor parent, but I know that God is still faithful, and I'm praying for Jason, that God will bring him back, and I hope you'll pray with me. But I'll tell you, parents have told me, Pastor, when something bad happens, and jail comes up, boy, my kids will go to church. And they'll, they'll, they'll seem like they're getting into God. And when everything cools off and they're free again, you don't see them anymore. And that isn't only for kids, ladies and gentlemen. That is very prominent among adults. Is that too strong a preaching? We're living in the light of eternity. Where is everybody? We had well over 400 this morning for worship just in here. We have 670 on the roll. We're worthy. Is that too strong? I believe we're living in the light of eternity. In the light of the second coming. I believe we will be judged for what we know. And beaten with many stripes. If we fail. All this hinges on the fact of missing the rapture. You say, well, thank God the rapture hasn't taken place. <clears throat> thank God is right. Because tonight, Christian friend, and if you're here and you don't know the Lord tonight, tonight's the night for you to make a consecration to God and say, Lord, I won't leave this building until everything is right with God. Everything is right. My heart's going to be clear. Because you see, folks, this is how critical this thing is. In the twinkling of an eye, just before I can even close my eyelid and open it again, a twinkle isn't even closing my <coughs> eye and open it. It's just a fraction of that. In the twinkling of an eye, 
this whole thing is going to happen. This whole thing. It's going to happen before you and I can even think. We're not going to have a chance. Oh, here comes Jesus. Be merciful to me. We're not going to have a chance for that. I'm sorry, Jesus, I let down. I'm sorry, God, I haven't been faithful. I'm sorry, God, my life hasn't been as holy as I promised to you it would be. Oh, God, wait just a moment. Wait till I get my things. Brother, it's going to be over. And after the rapture of the saints, Pastor, are there going to be people saved? Well, sure there are. There's going to be millions saved. Probably during the tribulation. But the only way they can be saved is to, first of all, not succumb to the mark of the beast. Now, if they couldn't be ready for the rapture, and the Holy Spirit has been lifted out of here as we know him in the church. Now, you've got to remember these steps. How many are with me so far and understand what I'm saying? If we can't be ready for the rapture, living a holy life and being faithful to God and doing what the word says here, how in the world are we going to refrain from taking the mark of the beast and giving our life to even get there? It's critical. Amen. Everything I'm doing behind this pulpit and for the Lord Jesus Christ hinges upon the twinkling of an eye. Amen. Have you thought about that? It hinges on that. Every moment from the time I get up until I go to bed, my whole existence hinges upon the fact of eternity. I could be here this second be gone the next second. I could be preaching the gospel and drop, God forbid, my wife says, that that would ever happen. I could be preaching and saying hallelujah, praise you Jesus and finish out the terminology over there. I preached a funeral yesterday. When it happens, sir, lady, when your number comes up, It's going to happen just as quick as if the rapture took place. You make a breath, and then you don't make another. You're out of here. The next step is to stand. After we see our body, after the rapture, if we're ready to go, is to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. There are people dying this second. I don't know how many are read statistics. I don't know whether it's two or three hundred in the world per second. Something like that. People die. That may even be increased now. At this moment, this second, bang, it's gone. Hundreds of people have died somewhere without God. Without God. The next big event for them, listen to me. It's the white throne judgment. That's the next big event for them. When Jesus looks at them with eyes of fire, and his tongue is a two-edged sword, and he says, you are not faithful to me. Lord, we cast out devils in your name. We touched the sick and they were healed. We preached the gospel and people walked the aisle to give their lives to Jesus. His eyes of fire are going to pierce them and say, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye worker of iniquity. Entering to hell's flame where the fire
Just as sure as I need a rebirth of the Holy Ghost, tonight as your pastor, I need a rebirth of a spiritual commitment. How many can say amen? I need a rebirth of spiritual commitment, living in the light of eternity. I've sort of lost where I was. I don't think I'm going to finish with my notes tonight. I think I'm just going to go this route. Maybe I'll pick this up in another Sunday night and finish. I have seven points, so you'll be glad I didn't do that. But I feel by the, by the Holy Spirit tonight that you, you, might, you might feel, I hope you don't feel this way. Pastor Thomas is being condemning tonight. I'm not being condemning. Folks, if we're sitting in these pews tonight and we don't have any of this to answer for, then we shouldn't feel bad. Am I right? If we made some promises to God and we haven't kept them, then tonight ought to be a night of commitment. It ought to be a night that we just gather around an altar and put our heads in the, in, in the altar and weep and ask God for forgiveness. And say, Lord, from this moment on, I, I, I'm going to, I, you can see the easy thing for you tonight is to say, well, never again will I ever make a promise to God. Well, that's frivolous. That's frivolous. Because one of the, one of the biggest things that's going to account for your rewards in mine are the promises that you live up to. It's called faithfulness. Am I correct? It's called faithfulness. If you make no promises to God and you're not faithful, you get no rewards. But if you make promises to God and you live them and you stick with them, then the Bible says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what he'll say to me and to you and to all of us. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You see, my ministry is not going to be equated about how many people are coming in. Somebody stopped me today at the restaurant. One of our good, faithful Christians, uh, I think it was Sister Dorsey, Helen Dorsey. She said, oh, Pastor Thompson, isn't our church growing? Isn't it wonderful? People are just coming in, new people, yes. But folks, let me tell you something. My, my reward before God is not based on that. you got to listen closely to me. This church can grow until it busts these walls out. And my reward will be zip. Unless I'm faithful. Am I correct? Unless I'm faithful. Because if I'm not faithful, then all this stuff is down the drain. It's down the drain. Everything I've said and done is valueless. That's why Paul said, I've been destitute, shipwrecked. I went on an aisle and had to pray that the snake wouldn't kill me. I picked up the firewood and it bit me. I've been in the sea. I've been in the storm. I've been beaten with many stripes. I've been lonely. I've been without a friend. And yet I know to whom I am pledged. In chapter 8 of Romans, what can separate me from the love? Given my whole life, Paul said. This is a guy I preached about this morning. This is a guy that beat Christians, that took them to the slaughterhouse and watched the lions rip their guts out. Pardon me for that expression. While the people, like in our ball games, clap and scream and yell, yay, ray, kill them. While Nero took them and hung them from his pillars in his courtyard poured hot wax over them and set them on fire while they were still alive and ate his dinners because the Christians could be heard on that pole saying, I will never relax, renounce my God. Talk about reward, mister. There's reward. It may sound like I'm being belligerent tonight, but before God, I'm not. I just say, church, with all that the Lord is beginning to do in our midst, if the church of today does not commit, we're going to lose a lot. We may have people speaking in tongues and have manifestations of the Spirit, but we're going to lose if we don't settle down 
get into the Word and find out what we need to do and then do it. Am I right? So it brings us back to this last thing. You're gonna, you folks are really proud of me. So I'm not going to preach much longer today. We're going to get around the altar. I, I spent time, I'll tell you, I usually have to have a, a time of laying before the Lord anymore. I don't know what sign that is, but uh, in the afternoon on Sunday, I got to lay down for about a half hour. I went in to lay down, and, and Rose was, I laid down, and this message began to come to my mind. I said, oh God, I got out and got on the side of the bed and began to pray. Lord, have I failed you in any part of my life? Oh God, don't let me stand in that pulpit tonight if I have failed you. If I have, I'm sorry, Jesus. Wash me in your blood and make me a better man. Help me, Lord, not just to be a preacher. Come here on Sunday morning and stand up and people say, preach a pretty sermon. Mm -hmm. But oh my God, help me to walk down the streets of this town in Morgantown. And people say, there goes a man of God and a man of prayer. There goes a man that stands for the quality of God's word. And you can bank your testimony example. That's what I want to be. There's only one way to do it. That is to never forget that I'm living under the light of the second coming. Every single moment. My words, my thoughts, my intents, my example has got to be God. I want to be sold out. And uh, my wife knows this, and I'm just going to include her in this. Physically, you know, we're all getting older. I just can't sometimes seem to do what I used to do, you know, like physically, you know. But I'll tell you, folks, I made a promise to God a long time ago, and Rose knows it. I want to be sold out to God. If I go out of this world, I want to go out doing God's work. Some way, somehow, doing His work. Proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. I close with this. There's not many of us in here that are preachers. A few of us scattered about. But all of us come from different walks of life and have different vocations. I remember when I had heart surgery and the last person's face that I saw was Marty's. Marty Fisher. Uh, Marty Eddy. Forgive me, Brother Eddy. Marty Eddy. They had shot me with something. And I was really, really feeling fuzzy. And I opened my eyes. And she had her hand on surgery unit, behind a pulpit, or whether you're driving a taxi cab. Wherever God places you, you be sold out. Be sold out to God. Then when the rapture takes place, we never at any time have to worry about missing. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Would you bow your heads with I remember those old services we've had in the past, not necessarily here, but anywhere. And it comes to church when the conviction of the Holy Ghost just comes down on the congregation. Everything gets real quiet. You can hear people praying. Sometimes you can hear somebody crying. So, oh God, help me. Help me. Help me. Tonight, the only one to call I know, and I know it's early. That has nothing to do with it. The only altar call I have tonight 
is that if you'll join me around these altars, I'm going to kneel myself if you'll allow me to do that. I'm going to kneel myself and I'm going to spend some time before my God. And I'm going to ask you to prepare me for the rapture and to help me to be ready, to cleanse me afresh and anew. Maybe somebody tonight, just before we come, would say, Pastor, I'm, I don't know whether I'm saved. From what I can see in the audience, I don't know of anybody that's not saved tonight, but I need to ask, is there anybody that's not sure? If you want to know in the bottom of your heart that you're ready, slip up your hand and say, Jesus, I want you to make sure I'm born again. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins and make me a new creature. Just slip your hand up and put it down. The Holy Spirit will see that. You ought not walk out of this church with a doubt, ever. Folks, my prescription for a continued outpouring of the Holy Spirit is that the church prepare herself for the coming of Jesus. That entails all kinds of stuff. Holiness, righteousness, determination, personal and spiritual grit that makes us do what we got to do. I want you to stand with me tonight. Would you please... And I'll tell you, we're just going to have just a general, I'm going to ask you to go someplace, find a place to pray, and, and let's deal with ourselves. I'm going to deal with me, okay? And I just urge you to deal with you. And let's walk out of this church tonight having said, okay, God, whatever it takes for me, I'm going to be ready. I'm going to live like it. I'm going to act like it. And I'm going to be faithful like it. Check out.